Welcome to the first uh, presentation of the Second Sunday Garden Forum presented by the Project Green and Iowa City Public Library. My name is Linda Schreiber, and I'm so glad to see a few brave souls in the audience. Our forums are a time when we gather, learn, renew friendships, and offer great gardening tips and inspire you for the season to come. Please take a moment and silence your cell phones, and we will take a short break after our presenter when you can purchase one of her books in the back of the room. Project Green Garden Forums are free and open to the public, and attendance qualifies for continuing education credit hours. Our thanks go to Beth Fisher, Bond Drager, Audrey today, and the Iowa City Public Library staff for hosting the presentations and providing our speakers with technical assistance. The program today is live streamed on the Iowa City Public Library's YouTube channel and can be viewed there at any time. Because the program is live streamed and our in-house and viewing audience won't be able to hear you, we ask that you write out your questions for Lisa during the break. There's a clipboard at the front table. Project Green was founded in 1968. Last year we celebrated 55 years of service to the community. Our nonprofit organization has devoted its resources and countless volunteer hours to beautifying green spaces and educating the public about the environment and conservation practices. Last summer, Project Green and the Iowa City Public Library partnered with environmental uh, organizations, including 100 Grannies, Backyard Abundance, Bur Oak Land Trust, Johnson County Master Gardeners, and the League of Women Voters of Johnson County to host the environmental documentary film, Kiss the Ground. We hope to host its sequel, Common Ground, shortly. Project Green has several activities uh, planned for 2024. Trout Leaf Native uh, Plants will partner with Project Green to offer a native plant sale at the Project Green Gardens on Saturday, May 18th. Project Green Gardens uh, will introduce, I'm sorry, Project Green will introduce a new event, a garden party on Saturday, June 22nd, highlighting the Project Green Gardens at 820 uh, Park Road. We're hosting another Open Gardens Weekend on Saturday and Sunday, July 13th and 14th. Please consider offering your garden or nominating other gardens. The activity features a variety of gardens and welcomes visitors without charge thanks to the generosity of the homeowners and our business sponsors. You can watch for details about all of these events on our website and at social media. Beginning the first Monday in May and most Mondays throughout uh, October, volunteers help plant and maintain Project Green Gardens at 820 Park Road. We help out from 9 to 11. It's a great opportunity to help um, exchange gardening information and tips and have the satisfaction of helping our community. There's a sign-up sheet in the back of the room. Project Green relies on financial contributions to enable us to continue our work, and we greatly appreciate your support. Donations can be made in three ways, on our website at projectgreen.org, at the Community Foundation of Johnson County at Project Green Endowment Fund, or via the City of Iowa City Green Fund. Today we're going to follow the format of our previous forums. Our speaker will present for 45 minutes to an hour. We'll take a break and reconvene when she will take your questions. So now let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce the first 24 2024 Garden Forum speaker with Lisa Hensman Howard, or as she's known in the Midwest as the Midwest Garden Gal. Today she's going to address GIY, Grow It Yourself, Veggies 101. She encourages gardeners to adopt the worldwide trend to grow your own food, to know your food. She will ease your gardening anxiety because she wants all gardeners, regardless of experience, to have success in the garden. She's a Lynn County Master Gardener with 20 plus years of gardening experience. In 2016, she formed Midwest Garden Gal, LLC. She published her book, Cheap Tricks Gardening, Because You Don't Need to Spend a Fortune for Fabulous. She's made numerous speaking uh, presentations at Master Gardener and other gardening events. Can you imagine taking a class from Lisa in her garden? 
one she's designed and built from the ground up, featuring extensive perennial and annual combination gardens, raised beds, using pots and other found objects, a custom-designed three-bin compost system, a native prairie garden, a garden shed with a front porch. I think that's called a she shed. No chandelier. <laughs> <laughs> and her own right. custom design <laughs> fire pit. Lisa is a gardening consultant with a BA in marketing and administrative management and a master's degree in leadership from Mount Mercy University. Strategic leadership, sorry. <laughs> can't read with my bifocals. Not the non-strategic <laughs> variety. <laughs> and an instructor at the University of Dubuque where she teaches marketing, public relations, and communication. And you can follow her at midwestgardengal.com. And today, during the break, remember to purchase one of her signed copies of her book. Now, on with the show. <laughs> Thank you so much, Linda. Thank you. Thank you to Project Green. I have to tell you, I am really geeked out about being at Project Green. I have been coming to these events right here in this room for decades, right? A couple decades, Mom. My mom, Linda, also a master gar Lynn County Master Gardener, is at the back of the room. She's, we like to call her the Midwest Garden Gal sidekick. <laughs> she is retired and fabulously joining me going across the country. Um, doing presentations and so I love it when she can join me and um, we are so excited to be here because uh, when Linda and special thanks to Linda who has worked really hard to put this together and get us connected and all of the many uh, for all the volunteers the people doing the food the people doing the tech there is so much that goes on to doing one single presentation I can't thank you enough but I do have to say that Project Green when I got Linda's message I was just lighting up and I immediately texted my mom and like, Project Green wants me to talk. And um, it's just because I've grown up with it, you know, for years and years I've been coming to these presentations. It really, um, in addition to my mother, it really infused my love of gardening by seeing these presentations over the years. So uh, when I mean to say it's really special, I do many, many talks around the country, but to be uh, just down the road from my home in Cedar Rapids and be at a Project Green event is really an honor. So thank you so much for the invite and, and thanks for being here, everybody. Thanks for braving the cold, right? Wow. <laughs> and the snow, you know, us Iowans are pretty hardy, but we haven't seen snow quite like this in quite a few years, right? So let's get on with the show because what better thing to do when it's cold and horrible out is to come talk about gardening, right? Okay, so I wanna know a little bit about you guys, right? Um, so let's talk about um, your gardening experience. Like just a show of hands, how many people are active vegetable gardeners now? Awesome, who is brand new to vegetable gardening? Awesome, okay. Um, so I was talking to somebody else who was like, I'm really experienced in vegetable gardening. I'm like, wow, I mean, you might need to teach me some things for this class, but I do want you guys to know you're gonna learn all the nuts and bolts here of um, basic vegetable gardening, but I hope that I've sprinkled in a few little tips and tricks that you might not have ever heard of before. So that's always my goal is to bring new and different information. The other thing I wanted to let you know is that um, we are, I'm working on putting the finishing touches on a brand new class that's gonna be veg vegetable gardening for all seasons, a wonderful um, next chapter after Veggies 101. So um, if you're interested, we're gonna be just down the road in Cedar Rapids the 17th of February um, at the Winter Gardening Fair, which is Lynn County, Master Gardeners event. Anybody gone to it? Lots of people. Anybody already registered for this one? Sweet. So anyway, vegetable gardening for all seasons. I don't honestly know if it's full or not yet, um, but there's 80 different classes you can choose from. So there's my shameless plug for Winter, winter Gardening Fair. Um, completely a fundraiser for Lynn County Master Gardeners. Uh, so please check it out. So let's, without further ado, get started, right? Okay, so most of you have vegetable gardened, a couple of newbies, and so I really am excited to hear your questions afterwards, after we get through the break. Sure I understand. And apparently my phone, or my Siri wants to talk to us on my, on my watch. Uh, that makes me think I should set, turn my phone off. Pause. I don't do that. Okay, we're good. All right. I can't promise Siri on my watch isn't gonna to talk to us, but. Okay, so Veggies 101. Um, this is just telling you if you want free tips and tricks in your email box, completely, completely unsubscribe anytime. I send out an email a couple times a month that will just keep you apprised. You will never miss a blog post of mine, which is all pure Midwest gardening information if you sign up for emails because you'll know first, um, 
what those new blog posts are, and you'll get seasonal information you can use all the time. One thing that's only in those emails is what I call timely tips. And so these are things you can use right now in your garden. Um, I definitely change them up each year as those seasons come around to share new timely tips that I've learned along the way and really see, like I might be talking a lot more about snow right now when I wouldn't have if we had no snow like, like we have in past years. All right, so without further ado, let's get into Veggies 101. Okay. Just getting started foundationally, I will tell you that this presentation is full of almost all pictures from my own garden. Cedar Rapids, Iowa, residential garden, nine raised beds, a lot of um, pots and vertical gardening and lots of that around. So I'm a big believer in a few things, raised beds we're gonna talk about, vertical gardening. So just things that have really worked well for me over the many years that I've been doing vegetable gardening. But this is um, indeed in my garden. One of the things I'm really excited about is uh, all raised bed gardening is really my approach or pots. Um, I'm not, I used to do in ground. I find it's just so much cleaner to do raised beds. I mean, I don't know if you guys have found that. And frankly, as I get older, I like it a lot, lot better if I'm not crawling around on the ground uh, and doing raised beds. It just seems a lot more uh, cleaner, I can get in the garden earlier, I can stay la longer, later, there's just lots of reasons that about that. I did want flowers into your vegetable garden. Are you guys doing flower garden with your vegetables? Things like nasturtiums is a wonderful plant that repels bugs and is beautiful and fabulous that you can plant around in your vegetable garden. Marigolds, of course. This one is Prince Charles clematis. Anybody growing it? Yeah. Have you had Prince Charles for a long time? Or maybe should we call him King Charles now? I don't think they're gonna rename it, but he, what a great, great clematis, would you agree? Do you have it growing on a trellis or on a? It's next to a deck, um, so it's part of my uh, pottery Yeah, yeah. I have a whole nother class about clematis we're not gonna get into today, but my point is, why not put flowers in your vegetable garden, right? It gives me such joy. Prince Charles is a ready, um, easy grow climber. So, um, reblooms for me, not as hardy as the first bloom, but what a great thing to just stick on a chain link fence if your vegetable gardens happen to be around fencing, you know? Instead of having just that fence stand in there, um, go ahead and add some flowers, add some climbers. You can do all kinds of things with flowers in your vegetable gardening. Doesn't have to just be veggies. Okay, so here's another shot. That is my shed at the back. Somebody said the she shed. I will tell you it's a fully functional shed. Um, I get a lot of questions about it because people are, are really interested in having the vegetable, a shed in their vegetable garden or any of their gardens. Um, so it's a custom made 10 by 10 shed with a five, uh, uh, I'm sorry, 12 by 12 shed with a five by 12 front porch. Uh, I love it. I spend lots of time there. It's full of tools, right? It's not a, um, it's not a chandelier -y she shed, um, but I love it so much. That front porch, I will say, if you're planning a shed, do that. And, and we, I, people have asked me, like, can I get the plans for that shed? Well, here's what happened. I drew it on a napkin, and I talked to some people at Kirkwood, and they needed projects for their new carpenters, and they built me this shed. I don't have the plans. I, they, you know, I drew it on a napkin and I bought them the materials they built the shed. So at any rate, many, many years ago, but I love adding those kind of elements in your garden as well. So yes, I know we're here to talk about vegetables, but I am one to like, let's bring some joy and fabulous into your gardening experience, whether it's vegetables, flowers, or what hardscapes. Think about bringing more joy through doing new and different things, like put a shed in your garden and build your landscaping around that. Um, I was talking to uh, someone just prior to the talk. Was it you, Linda, that we were talking about the mental health um, uh, benefits of gardening? Okay, I want to tell you that vegetable gardening is such a great one. Uh, you guys feel good after you garden? Have you been out there gardening? Has anyone read or saw the information about the microbes that are in the soil, right? You're literally absorbing. I saw some heads saying no. You are absorbing through that soil, microbes that are beneficial to you, particularly for your mood. So it's very, very good for you to take those gloves off and sink your hands in that soil. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. And that is a huge reason why you feel so good. Yes, you're also getting exercise, which also releases all those endorphins. But uh, a lot of people don't realize just putting your hands in the soil, it's a wonderful thing for improving uh, your mental health, which what a great time when we're talking about 
January 15th and it's horrible outside, you know, even inside, think about, you know, your potted plants and things, get your hands in that soil whenever you can. Okay, so uh, we do a lot of vertical gardening in my garden. And when I say we, I mean me. <laughs> and I have, I have a couple of adult children that are mostly on their way now. Um, and, and, you know, they used to get out there and pull weeds for me. But, you know, when they get to be young 20s, At any rate, uh, yes, there's lots of vertical gardening going on here, so we're going to talk about them in details, but I just wanted to say, um, mention that there's some grow bags happening. Uh, if you have not grown potatoes, and potato grow bags have the kind that where the flaps full, come up higher, um, or um, if you've not grown carrots in grow bags, those are the most successful things that I've done in grow bags to date. They love that drainage. Has anyone done grow bags for carrots or potatoes? Did you do potatoes? What are you growing in your grow bags? It was uh, salad, carrots, and spinach. Great, wonderful. That drainage that you get with a grow bag is incredible. The one thing I'll say about grow bags, when they go into that shed, they need to get put away in something that seals tight. Anyone know why? They're like fabric. Anyone know why you want to seal up your grow bags tight? Yes, <laughs> despite my best efforts. I have a 100-acre field that you can't see in these photos. Um, immediately to the west in my garden, and I have mice. So I do my darndest. Unfortunately, they don't seem to get in my house, you know, <laughs> but I get lots of them in the shed. So if you think about when you're storing things, be sure that you're sealing up your supplies that you might get some visitors that you don't want. The nuts and bolts here. I always point at the screen. I'm not even sure where I point, but it seems to be working. Uh, okay, so let's talk about tools. You guys are all mostly seasoned vegetable gardeners. Not sure who we have on um, participating online, but I assume we have a whole variety of gardeners. But I want you to start, since this is Veggies 101, I want you to understand the foundation. And you are welcome to take pictures of any of the slides. There is a lot of content in this program. Uh, please do take pictures of the slides uh, and utilize that information. There's also a lot of this you can find in my book or on my blog online. But you're welcome to take pictures of any of the slides because you're going to find out there's quite a bit of information here that you might want to come back to. These are what I consider to be the essentials. I'll just let you guys take a look at that. Let me know if you have any questions. Does anybody have any uh, must-have tools they don't see up here that they want to throw on my list? Trake. Tell me about a trake. Ooh, I feel like I need a trach. <laughs> Anybody else have a trach? All right. <laughs> I have one of the things, it's really not on this list here. I don't even know what it's called, but it's the claw thing that has the handles that are opposite sided, like for blending up your raised beds. They are great for that. So widely available. Um, but there, those don't forget about safety goggles. Uh, I can't tell you, has anyone been poked in the eye while they're working out in the garden? Oh, it does not feel good. For me, it happened when I was clearing gardens in the spring and I got, you know, a branch or something right in the eye and it's really horrible and it's just, uh, it can really be damaging. So be sure to have safety goggles. I must confess, oftentimes for me, it's sunglasses, which aren't as good as safety goggles, but you know, I always say that we, tr we do what we can, right? Um, but even having sunglasses or your own glasses, something protecting your eyes is a good idea. And then, of course, don't forget the sunscreen, all important tools that could go on this list. Okay, um, here is my favorite um, tool. This is straight out of Cheap Tricks Gardening, my book. Um, can anybody tell me what that receptacle is? Yes. Good job. That's exactly right. It is a shower caddy. Uh, I will tell you that this is the single-handed most important tool in my garden. Because look at all in the garden. Have you ever gone on a hunt for the expensive tools laying in your garden? Right? This is a wonderful cheap trick for you to be able to carry all your essentials. You know, your water, your phone, your sunscreen, your gloves, your anything you want. 
I love it so much that I have one in my backyard that lives in the shed, and I have a fully stocked one in my garage that handles my front yard and side yard gardening. So if you are not using a shower caddy, and a really great time is like back to school time, you can get a really good one. Don't go cheap on them. I will tell you the Dollar Tree is great for a lot of things. You can find a lot of cool things you can use in your garden at the Dollar Tree. Don't get your caddy there. Too small, too wimpy. You want a good, sturdy, not too crazy big, because you gotta lug that thing around, but you'll never lose your tools again, right? So I love that idea, that straight sitting in my garden, and I love the shower caddy. Okay, I really am gonna talk about vegetable gardening, uh, but we have to start from the beginning, right, and give you a basic foundation. Okay, so we talked a little bit about raised beds. Um, who is gardening in raised beds? Lots. Who is gardening in ground? Yep, works too, right? Who, you're, who's doing a combination? Yep. There's all kinds of ways to do it. So I just personally focus on and prefer raised beds. You know, one 45-minute uh, presentation, we can't get to everything. Uh, so I focus in this session about raised beds. I also think for a brand new gardener, it's an easy way to get started. You don't have to like till up a bunch of land. You, you know, you can make a raised bed pretty easily and you can get started. Okay, so here's reasons for raised, right? Very productive in small space, vertical gardening. That's what I was talking about. Lots of trellises. Um, you guys know what a cattle panel is? You can get them at Tyson's for like 20, used to be for like 20 bucks. Now probably 25, um, as is our world now. Very, um, for the people that are looking at me like, I don't know what a cattle panel is. Um, yeah, there's pictures of it, so we'll get to that. But um, yeah, so it's like the world's best trellis, right? Is anyone else using cattle panels for trellises in their garden? Yeah. There's tons of plans if you Google or go on YouTube about cattle panel trellis. And for me, I have an art, a cattle panel arch, and they're pretty, they're tough. Like, it's a little bit of a job to get that bent and get that positioned. But once you have it, it will last forever, fully galvanized. It will never, ever uh, rust. So it's a great solution for your vertical gardening. You're going to need some really good wire cutters, really strong. Um, probably a helper. You might need some T-posts to get it um, held into position. Tons of plans online, so check that out. Um, but again, back to the, the reason why. So productive. I'm doing a lot of vertical gardening to get that productive. Prevent soil compaction and plant damage. Your roots are nice and loose if you're going to do great, ra great soil in it, and I'll tell you about my preference on the soil here shortly. Um, earlier and longer growing season, why? Versus in ground. Right. Yeah, you bet. That's exactly right. You can get in there sooner. The soil gets warm faster. Um, you know, from my perspective, the soil usually is warmer later into the season. It just is uh, a wonderful thing. Less weeding and maintenance, for sure. I mean, I used to come in for my in-ground garden, and I was just filthy, right, from head to toe. And now I can go out uh, in my raised beds. I got my nice paths, and I can work in the garden for, you know, an hour or two and clean up briefly and go on to my next thing. So... Um, it just works really well. Uh, let's see what else we want to touch on there. Uh, control over your soil, we're going to talk about that. Uh, perfect for gardeners with disabilities. You can do a really tall one that could be wheelchair accessible with paved paths. I mean, there's just a great deal you can do. And then suit, shape to suit your space. It does not have to be the classic rectangle. It really does not. I'm going to tell you about what I don't want it to be, and that is too big. And my picture here on purpose Looks really cute, right? What's the problem that you see in the raised bed for the raised bed gardeners out there? That is, so I'm here professing that it should be six by four foot is probably about the biggest you'd want. I love a long skinny one, right? This garden right now does not have that bed there anymore. So I've replaced it with a as long as you want. Um, but you need to be able to reach in from all sides, right? So as long as I have a long skinny bed, like a three foot by whatever, I can reach everything, right? This bed was when I didn't know what big, and it's also, I would say, not deep enough. So I always forever wished it was deeper. So now I'm using like 10 foot boards. So um, not in length, but um, you know, what do I want to say? Height, yes, the height, 10 feet. So when it's standing on its end, um, 10 inches. Sorry, 
inches. And so you want, that would be like a really great depth. I think these are six inch um, height boards, um, just not deep enough. So I learned my lessons. I mean, yeah, I grew stuff, but because the one thing you don't want to do with your raised beds, you really want to avoid stepping into them. How come? Compact. Yeah, compacts your soil, really messes with the roots. Try not to step into your raised beds. This class doesn't have enough time to get deep on building them, but there are a gajillion uh, plans online. Um, extremely easy to build. One thing I will say is that today's pressure treated lumber um, is safe. Right, so um, in the old days, the pressure treated really bad chemicals on it. Um, today's pressure treated lumber has been proven that it's safe to use for your bed garden. All of my gardens are pressure treated lumber. going strong. Uh, if you use regular lumber without the pressure treated, you're gonna get maybe a year or two and they're just gonna fall apart on you. So, um, so you can certainly expensive. I don't mean, seeing, I shouldn't say crazy. <laughs> I'm a little bit of a cheapskate when it comes to gardening. I would say very expensive gardens if you're going cedar, especially in today's world. Have you guys seen the price of lumber since derecho? Woo, wow. So safe allows and you want to do cedar, it can certainly work equally as well. It's, certainly, it's very beautiful, but a lot more expensive. Avoid railroad ties. In the old days, people were doing gardens with railroad ties all over the place. It's coated with a thing called creot, which is really bad and can leach into your food and proven to cause cancer. So you definitely, or creosote, I'm sorry. Uh, you definitely don't want that. Other things you can get inventive with, concrete blocks, tires, straw bales. Has anyone done straw bale gardening? Yeah, works really well, right? Um, so just be really, if it can hold soil, it could be a raised bed, right? I personally, are you guys lining your raised beds like the bottom? I never have. People are like, uh, people are afraid of moles and I've got all the varmints with a hundred acre field right next to me. I've never had a problem with things coming up underneath in my raised beds. By all means, if you're interested and you wanna use like, it's called hardware cloth, like the graded uh, metal, you can put that in the bottom of your raised bed. What I'll tell you is that you're going to be annoyed with it eventually when you're trying to work in there and dig your soil in. And I've just had no problem. So you can think of it as the frame of my raised bed is sitting directly on top of the ground. So I level it out, make it all nice. The frame goes right on top. That's all I do. So it's simple um, for sure. You know, a nice summertime shot in my garden. This is a pea fence, but you could, you could climb anything on beans, peas. It's a really nice size for peas. That actually came from a very dangerous company called Gardner's Supply Company. Anybody shopped with them? Woo, right? Super high quality, super expensive in my opinion, uh, but really wonderful quality. Um, so yeah, I love that pea fence has been in my garden. And even the net on it has lasted for five, six years. Um, Fortunately, this year, the sparrows are eating all my peas. Anybody have ever had that happen before? They're talking to each other. They really are. They're putting out an all-points bulletin. My neighbor planted peas. They were eating her peas, too. I don't know why. So, uh, but then mom was growing beautiful peas, so I don't know. But uh, at any rate, so again, that's just an example of vertical gardening. Um, so yeah, lots of opportunities to do raised beds in your garden. You can see I personally mulch my beds. Um, you'll see some other pictures where I am bordering all of my areas with um, large field stones. Anybody got farmers in their family? No farmers in here? <laughs> Anybody is a farmer? All right, so in eastern Iowa, we have a lot of rocks in the fields, right? And farmers don't like the rocks. So you see the rock piles all over the place. My uncle farms. So I was able to border all of my beds with these rocks, and then I put in these raised beds. Now see, what's the problem here? It's not a problem when you know what's behind this. Raised beds. Um, no, I take that back. All of these are thoroughly protected. Some of the, I, on the other side, when we get to those pictures, um, if there's no bunny fence, you got a problem, right? And we're gonna talk about that a little bit too. But since then, I've put in, I put in all of these bunny fences. And then I have another bunny fence that's going on the outside too. So I've got like 
uh, super protection. You know how these extra bunny fences came to be? So there's a whole border I'll show you in a minute uh, outside. So you, if you put a big bunny fence border uh, and you're using the shorter T posts, like the three footers, you put your bunny fence and then you can have multiple raised beds inside that, right? I also bunny fenced all these extra bunny fences came to be, which is fine. Do I need them? Probably not. You know why they came to be? I got a puppy, a big puppy. And she jumped the bunny fence and then was jumping into the raised beds. But she wouldn't jump in if I had them bunny fence. So that was just a little too tight on space. So anyway, overkill on the bunny fence. But I will tell you, you must have a bunny fence if you're vegetable gardening. Is anybody vegetable gardening without a bunny fence since we have some experienced gardeners? Nobody. <laughs> you are? How do you do it? You just go for it? OK. Tell me more. Like, how is your ratio? Like, are, are, are you guys getting along pretty well? Um, I, I lost, like, all Yeah, yeah. OK. You know what? I'm so glad you said that. So was it like you just knew, didn't know, right? It wasn't like you wanted to share with the animals? Or? Like the way that the chicken wire looks. Yeah. So I just wanted to I will tell you, the chicken wire is pretty wimpy. Um, try, they, at, like, at all the home improvement stores, they sell whole rolls of, they usually have a rabbit on the label, and it'll say bunny fence. They're usually three foot tall, galvanized. Um, I do that with the three foot tall T-posts, and then I just use thin wire. That's what I do for mine, and they look way nicer, and they last a lot better. Because frankly, I've fallen over a bunny fence or two, <laughs> so now I have gates, you know. <laughs> so if you can put a gate in, but again, the problem is you got to keep those critters out, and, I, and the gates can be an issue with that. Insert double bunny fencing, right? So if you're going to put a gate in, I'm telling you what, that's going to be an entry point for your critters by and large. So anyway, yes, um, consider a bunny fence will help you not have them eat all your Swiss chard. Um, but if you were fully like, you know what, that's what I love to do, I love to share everything with them, then more power to you. It's your garden. You do it the way that you want to do it. OK, um, so uh, a lot of times you'll see people talk about a third, a third, a third, this recipe with regard to um, the recipe that I like to use for the soil that goes into my raised beds. I personally go a little heavier on the compost. A lot of people be like, oh, it's going to be too heavy. From my experience, I like this mix, right? It's got a little more nutrients in it. I just appreciate it. You have to put in the peat moss and the vermiculite to lighten that soil. If you use purely compost, and a lot of new gardeners will do that, they just fill it with compost. They're like, that's perfect. A little strong, really. I mean, nutrients are great, but it can almost be a burning effect. Compost is so um, easy to work with, highly unlikely, but it's just going to get really hard and compact, right? That compost is heavy. Um, so definitely, I prefer a little heavier on compost. I will tell you, there's no measuring happening. I'm using this lasagna method, right? I'm throwing it in there. And every year, I'm just topping it off with more. But this is kind of the ratio that I like to get to, right? And you'll know it once you've gardened for a few seasons. Because when you pick it up and you squeeze it, and then you do that. So it'll, it'll feel really good and pretty well hold together, but then it'll crumble apart pretty easy. Now, if it's way too crumbly, then you've got too much of the peat and vermiculite, right? If it's way too stuck together, you've got too much of the, of the compost. Does this make sense? All right. So don't overthink it, please. Just throw it in there. Get your little pitchfork. I love the, anyone have the pitchforks that are kind of like the half size handle? They're just a great length for you to be able to step in there and the handle stops about right here. I love those pitchforks that are not so tall because the big ones are like, <laughs> you know, and I'm a tall girl, but they're just so very tall. Um, or you can use the little twisty thing we talked about with the, with have the teeth on it. So there's all kinds of opportunities. Don't over blend it because you want it to get nicely mixed, but you don't want to pulverize it. Certainly do not put a tiller in your raised bed, please. You're just over, you're hurting your soil because you're just totally pulverizing it down to too much. There's not a necessity for that, OK? All right, um, compost natural fertilizer. 
Uh, da -da -da. Yeah, you can top dress with additional compost. So uh, throughout the season, you can certainly add more compost or, you know, frankly, like gar garlic that we're going to talk about. We plant that in the fall. You could come around and top dress. doesn't really need it, but if it makes you feel better, um, you can certainly give them a little love that way. Um, you really don't need additional, compo uh, additional fertilizer. I will tell you, I fertilize my tomatoes pretty heavily. Um, there's a blog post on my website, like my 12 best tips for tomatoes. I, it's in the book as well. Um, so there are exceptions, right? Tomatoes are heavy fe feeders, peppers are heavy feeders. Um, so there are exceptions, but by and large, compost is a really perfect fertilizer. Make sure you're incorporating that. I don't know if Iowa City has free compost at your municipal sites. Yes, I'm getting thumbs up. Uh, we do in Cedar Rapids as well. It's wonderful stuff. So I've read the materials. If you go on their website, you can see the, the science behind it. These are really hot, hot piles. If you've gone there, um, anybody climb Mount Trashmore in Cedar Rapids? You guys should pay it. Yes, a few of you. You should pay it a visit. It's totally fun, totally free. Um, and you're really cr cl climbing up the old garbage dump that got capped years ago, and then they made it into these beautiful nature trails. Um, you can see down into where they're making compost from the top of Mount Trashmore. And when you come down the backside, if you haven't gone down the backside of it, you'll see all of it. It's really impressive. And those, those piles are steaming. They're so hot. Um, so very controlled, very um, healthy to use the municipal uh, compost. All right, let's get down to it. Okay. Plant what you love. And again, take pictures because these slides are pretty beefy. Um, so the best advice I have is grab your phone, take a pic so you have this information um, and you'll, you'll have that all right there. Uh, I have this information in my book. I'm also working on a new blog post that's going to get even broader on vegetable gardening. So kind of in conjunction with my new veggie class, I'm excited to bring that expansion to Veggies 101 to everybody. Um, so uh, I'm really focused because this is Veggies 101 on the easy grows, right? One of the greatest reasons to grow your own vegetables is because you can find find things, particularly if you start growing by seed, a little advanced for this class. We're going to touch on it very briefly. But you can find seeds that you could never find the plants for in, in a nursery, right, and grow them. Iowa is extremely perfect for growing lots and lots of things, right? We have wonderful um, atmosphere for that. So think about gardening from a not only can I grow lots of food, save money, grow healthier food that I know where it came from and how it was grown, I can also grow things I won't find anywhere else, right? Really unique squashes. There's just a lot of different things you can do. OK, so really um, briefly, I wanted to talk about uh, don't forget the food banks, right? So you can, what are you going to do with all this harvest? I don't know about you guys, but I go, when it gets to be harvest season, particularly like when I get to August and I have what I call tomato palooza, right, amongst all the other vegetables, right? All those warm season veggies that we're going to talk about come on all at the same time, it seems. And so all of a sudden, I've got everything. My freezer's full. I don't, I, you know, I've canned and canned, which I really don't like to can. Um, but at any rate, don't forget the food banks, right? They're very appreciative of fresh produce. It's incredibly expensive for them to buy it. So they will willingly take your donations. So think food banks when you get inundated with produce. Um, so then here's some easy grows for quick successes. Some things are direct sown outside better, than, and some things are from transplant, which when I say from transplant, that's the plants you get in the nursery, although you can also grow them from seed under grow lights. It's a little deeper of a, of a conversation. We're not getting too deep into that here, but you can do that. I will say if you are a fairly new gardener, or if you're just like, man, I'm too tired for all that, <laughs> then you just go with these easy options for growing. So you're going to do a direct sown outside. These are the things. I'm not going to read them all, but all of these items, and we're going to get into cold season or warm season uh, and what that all means. But these are a mix of things that you can definitely grow fairly easily and be successful at it. Because that's what we want, right? If you're a newer gardener, which I know a lot of you are experienced, but we want you to have quick success. Okay, from transplant, uh, broccoli, herbs, onion, pepper, and the rest, tomatoes certainly. Again, you can grow them. Anybody growing your tomatoes from seeds since we have some experienced gardeners or peppers? Yeah, absolutely it can be done. Is it a lot harder than buying a transplant at the nursery? Yeah, it's, a war it's work, right? You got to take care of it. You got to keep them watered under the right lighting. Um, so I will say if you're a brand new gardener, don't start with you know, the transplants from seed go to the nursery, grab your transplants, okay? Uniquely awesome, 
as garlic, potato, and rhubarb. And the reason I say that, garlic, you're planting in the fall, um, harvesting for me in usually June. We're going to talk, talk about um, is that hole where you have to add soil, build them up to do your potatoes. And then rhubarb. Um, I have my grandfather's rhubarb in my garden that I, I love. Uh, on my blog list, I, I need to get written, is like I want to do one on heritage gardens. Anybody got wonderful things in their garden that came from a family member, maybe who's no longer with us? Yeah. So my grandmother, my grandfather, I have lots of things from their garden. They were avid gardeners, and I love that. So, um, but point being, rhubarb, once you have it, you should have it forever. You know, it's really, really hardy. It's going to come back for you every spring. You can, um, you know, harvest on it for months. It's fabulous and many unique recipes for rhubarb. Okay, we're going to talk about the seed packet, okay? So especially for new gardeners, I want you to know that all you need to know, mostly, about that plant is on, a, on the seed packet. Same thing with at the nursery by a little lesser degree is the transplant tag, right? So oftentimes when I'm talking to people or talking to clients that I do um, visits at their home gardens is, did you read the tag? You know, not in a rude way like that sounded. <laughs> but just like, hey, did you know there's a lot of great information on the tags? Because um, there is, right? And has anyone ever worked in a nursery? Because, like, I just bless them, seriously, because they're getting all kinds of questions that are right on that tag there, right? You know, so at any rate, don't forget to read the tags, and especially a seed packet, because you have so much information. Well, from the very beginning, there's the planting instructions. This is going to happen on every single seed packet. Well, first of all, here's the variety. It's going to give you the common name. It's going to give you the Latin name. It's going to tell you what kind of vitamins is in it. It's going to give you the planting instructions. Here's some good suggestions. And here's the really big stuff. Days to germination, that's how long it's going to take before your seed um, germinates into a plant. Uh, planting depth, this is how, how deep they want you to plant it in the soil. Days to harvest, so uh, from the point for you to harvest it. And we got thinning, spacing, spacing. It's got spacing information over there. So they all vary a little bit. I love this little map because it's going to tell you when you should plant it, right? And it'll always tell you, direct sow it outside, like uh, beets are a great one that you can direct sow outside. Plant, you know, plant it from transplants, it'll tell you. Now, one thing I want to talk to you about is uh, the, the use-by date on seed packets. Is that real? Are your seeds expired the first year you buy them? No. Why do they put, a, why do they put that expiration date on your seed packets? Sell more seeds, right? Okay, in all honesty, it is important that there's an expiration date on it because you want to know how old your seeds are. But uh, every study that's out there says that but three, three to four years, they vary by what the plant is, but three to four years you can be using those seeds easily. And then if you want to get deeper, there's some things you can do about how to test those seeds. So you can Google that. It's like a wet paper towel in a plastic bag. Has anyone ever tested their seeds to see if they'll germinate? Yep, really easy to do. A little deep for this class. You can, you can do that. The point is, do, please don't throw away your seeds after year one. You can certainly use them again and again for a couple years to come, okay? A couple more examples of seed packets. I'm just showing you that they all contain this really important information uh, that will really help guide your uh, planting. For one thing, sow continuously for constant supply of lettuce. So, so many times, new gardeners, we will, and me included when I get really busy, you get that first batch of lettuce seeded, and that's it, right? And you get it all harvested, done, no lettuce. If you are continually seeding that lettuce, so let's say you're having your few rows of lettuce, and then you have other rows, or you can even interspace the, the new rows, and, you know, two weeks later, you come out, you sow your other seeds, right? Now you're having a continuous harvest of lettuce in this example. So about planting, like they call it succession planting, uh, so that you can get continuous harvest. Okay, just a few more seed packet examples, so you can check that out. Okay, I wanted to pause here because um, sweet pepper and tomato, we're going to get into the warm and cold season crops. What are peppers and tomatoes, warm or cold season? Warm season, yes, and so for the newbies, uh, the warm season, it just means that you're well after the frost date, and we're going to talk about that a little bit more thoroughly, too, but I wanted to 
to, so that you could see that in this case, it's telling you a, a harvest about 75 days after transplanting. It wants you to do this by transplants. So good uh, opportunity. You're just going to know once you start doing a lot of vegetable gardening. As, the, as these experienced gardeners knew right away, these are warm season crops, right? They're not getting planted till usually Mother's Day-ish time, and we're going to talk a little more about that. But this is an example uh, of where you can clearly identify immediately whether you knew or not, oh, I would call it a warm season vegetable, right? Okay, so tips for growing from seed sown outdoors. Okay, so we talked about a number of them that we could grow outdoors. And um, I'm going to buzz through pretty quick as I'm seeing my time. <laughs> Read the packet and believe it, right? So know that every time you get some seeds, make sure you are reading the packet. It's got a wealth of information. So it's also important to keep that packet, right? You can go back to that again and again uh, for that information. So the subsequent year, you've got that packet. Make sure you're storing it where mice won't get to it. Can you tell I have a mouse problem? <laughs> so, um, but keep them secured. I keep mine in a dry basement. I mean, mine in the basement is very dry. I keep it, keep them there. And I use a hardware um, container, like the drawers for hardware. Um, there are some that are the perfect size of a seed packet. Cheap trick, you can pull that drawer out, put your seed packet in, I label up those drawers. But the point is, those packets keep the packet. Don't dump them into some other receptacle. You're going to regret that later. Okay, and then I'm going to buzz through and just hit some of the highlights. Uh, we talked about the hardware organizer. We talked about the experience. So I think we've covered all of this, but I wanted to mention about squash, right? Okay, um, have you had squash borers in your garden? So your squash, <laughs> mom's raising her hand. Me too. Me too, mom. Um, so your squash is beautiful, it's looking fabulous, um, really wonderful plants. They're just like so awesome. You're going to have friends over to take a look at your beautiful squash plants that are just about blooming, or maybe they are blooming. And overnight, what happens? They're dead, right? They're totally wilted. They're horrible. That is a sure sign of a squash borer. I spent years battling that squash borer. I was doing like toilet paper holder. Okay, so the, the squash borer is from that moth, right? The squash borer moth. If you see that naughty moth with the red and black, that is not a good moth. So if you can get him, probably not, but that is a sign you have a squash borer moth in your garden. They are laying eggs on your squash for sure. Um, so what I will say is that I will always tell you to, to plant your squash from seeds. Okay, so that's the first tip. Why? Easy for sure. At the nursery, do you think the squash borer moth comes and visits the nursery? Yes, of course. They're like, the buffet's open. <laughs> and then you bring home the beautiful plant, you plant it, and then a few, you know, maybe a week less later, your plant is like dying. You know, usually it may take a couple weeks. But yeah, he, you're growing from seed and growing after June 1st. Virtually eliminate the squash borer from your life. I promise. I was, so what I was saying is I was using toilet paper rolls, foil, because it's to the soil where they lay their eggs. Uh, there's all this fiction out there. Like, I carefully put the toilet paper roll over the stem. Has anyone done this stuff? I was wrapping foil around. I was on a mission. Then somebody said, just plant late. I'm like, oh, that's it. And it works every time for me. Now, we have weird weather going on. So who knows if we get off on that. But I have times when I'm not planting my squash until like, we're going into the second week in June. They're very fast growing. Um, they're fantastic, and I've never again had a squash borer problem, okay? So it grows very quickly. So uh, there's my tip for you. Here is a trip to the nursery. We could have a problem in my family. I, I will say that it was my mom's fault. That's 99% her plants. Is that true? <laughs> she, she says, could be. <laughs> I just love that picture because it shows the um, problem we have gardening in our family, but you know, I mean, there's ha habits you could have, right? So um, do what you love and know that this is completely sane. So no problem, right? So check it out, have some fun with it, and you might fill an SUV with your plants. It's okay. 
All right, so let's talk about cool season vegetables. So this is some lettuce um, I planted, and I will tell you with the cool season, you're usually getting going in April, but then you're gonna plant them again later in the season. And, and usually for me, if I'm being good, I'm getting out back out there in like uh, even August, even though we think it's all hot and horrible, those seeds need time to germinate, and then you're gonna get that harvest in the fall. So think about har planting cool season vegetables, almost all of them. Um, depend, you got to read that tag and know that germination period or that whole length of to harvest period. But if you can very much plant things like, like lettuce, we're going to talk about more of them, and you can get a really good harvest twice, right? So is anybody planting again in the fall? Is anybody only planting in the fall? Okay, yeah. So you can do all kinds of things with it, but you can certainly... Um, Take your seed packet, calculate that information, and you can use some veggies. So no, usually a lot of them are happening in April. Some of them like radish, say as soon as the ground can be worked. Um, I've had radishes that it's going in in March for sure, depending on the, the weather. So you just kind of got to play it by ear. But that's some lovely lettuce that I actually plant, planted for fall. So you can I plant that in August. By the time it's growing up, it's cooled down get some beautiful lettuce, and I was harvesting that in September. Um, so you certainly can do that. Okay, warm season veggies are gonna be the ones like tomatoes, peppers, and those are the ones almost across the board that you're planting after Mother's Day to be safe, right? And I will tell you, yes, you can, you can watch the forecast, and you can be like, ooh, I'm gonna go for it, or you can just get the itch, and some nice days come. But be careful about those early days in May, right? Anybody heard of the three cold kings? Right, that's three straight days in May when it gets very, very cold. And it's usually toward mid-May. Um, you know the dates uh, for sure. I have, a, I have a blog post about it. I have to go like look it up every time. But it's right there in the center of May. It's an old Czech um, story. And it comes true again and again and again, right? It'll be beautiful and gorgeous late April into May, and then plummets, and then we're out there covering things because we planted too early. And I'll tell you that your warm season vegetables like tomatoes and peppers, they don't want to be out there when it's really cold. The soil temperatures are not good enough, um, so don't be afraid to wait. Some people are like, I'm not going to plant my tomatoes and peppers until more like Memorial Day. That's okay, right? So I kind of get the itch too soon, but Mother's Day, and then I love um, Weather Channel app. Like there's tons of, who has, who has multiple weather apps on their phone, right? Because we're gardeners, right? We care about weather. And I will tell you that um, there's many good ones, but I really like weatherchannel.com because it has extended way out there. I mean, they're like two plus weeks now. Um, so that will give you a really good sense of what's likely to happen. It really helps when you're plan planning your garden and when you're going to get those things planted. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a ton of time to get deep on the specifics of the whens of all of that, but you can Google um, plans online, and I'm working on a new blog post that's going to get deeper on this as well. So more information to come, but you guys are seasoned gardeners, and if you're not, just Google um, you know, a, a vegetable planning guide for zone five in this case, if you're in this area. Otherwise, you can look up your USDA s s zone hardiness. That means how cold can it get and this plant's still alive? That's the essence of the USDA hardiness. Um, zone five, five B here, yeah. Um, for the folks online, you may be listening from anywhere and just Google USDA hardiness zone and you'll know what your zone is. All right. Okay, so just a couple of highlights. I just love that picture of all the different wonderfulness that you can pull right out of your own garden. And so lots of different varieties. So I, I mentioned the squash that you can get lots of different colors and shapes and sizes, particularly because you can grow it from seed and you're starting those seeds after June 1st, which we've learned for, and that goes for all the squashes, right? And you can get lots of colors and definitely think about eating the rainbow. So um, it's best for your nutrition. Just really have some fun with it. Okay, I wanted to touch on a few. We don't have too much time left. Um, so I wanted to talk about eight months or more of kale. Who loves kale? This is usually where I have a few people like timidly like, oh, I admit it, I love kale, right? Kale has really come along on the love factor. It used to be like nobody raised their hand. They're like, oh, kale. 
I will tell you that kale is super hardy. And so I want you to know, I'm just touching on a few things that are different from what you could Google or the average information that you'll find online. Uh, so you can get kale for eight months out of the year. Is anybody growing kale for that amount of time? Yeah, yes. So you can plant it very early, right? You can do it from seed. Are you doing seed transplants, growing your own? Seed, yeah, straight from seed. When do you plant your kale out? Yeah, March potentially, yeah. Have you ever had your kale winter over if you left it in the garden? Me. Right, not always, right? For me, um, it gets real mad when it has snow on it, and then it goes, whoa. But, <laughs> but I've had kale winter over in my Cedar Rapids, Iowa garden unprotected. Um, and so I was pretty impressed with that kale. Uh, so not always, but you can certainly get this amount of kale. And so what I wanted to point out is, um, and there's tons of varieties. The, the kale featured in these pictures happens to be one I love called Blue Vades. Have you grown Blue Vades? Try Blue Vades, I love it. There's different names of it, but V-A-T-E-S, V as in Victor. It's a great variety. Definitely, um, you can get it from seeds. Sometimes I see it at the nurseries. Um, so yeah, check that out. But Blue Vades is my favorite kale. There's lots of opportunities for kale. I really like the curly leafed ones more than the flat leafed. I see a lot of heads nodding. I don't know, it's me. For one thing, the bugs seem to eat the heck out of my flat leafed and they kind of leave my curly leaves alone. Uh, but it's up to you. Uh, so you can do all kinds of things with kale. Please just Pinterest as your friend and Google for recipes on kale. There's so much more you can do with it than you know. Okay, here's the basic though. I want you to know how you keep it going. Right here in the center, of this blue vades kale plant, that is called the terminal bud. This is the key to keeping your kale going. Terminal bud means that you are har um, never harvesting that center part. Then by the end of the season, it looks like this Dr. Seuss plant over here. Um, so a little Dr. Seuss tree going, that that's about all that's left of it. This is in December, still going in my garden. Okay, and I've been harvesting these plants all season long, okay? So it'll start slowing down on you. But because I didn't take out the terminal bud, it keeps putting out leaves. So obviously it's gonna slow down when it gets super cold, but just know when, in the old days, I'd whack the whole plant off and be done, right? I didn't know any better. And then I learned about the terminal bud. And then this right here is pretty proud of it. I harvested this and we had it with our Thanksgiving day dinner. Full serving of kale. I mean, I have five, six kale plants, but Definitely still getting that quantity of kale. You can also blanch it and freeze it, bust it off and put it into soups and stew. It's a powerhouse of nutrition, right? It's largely credited with like pioneers with like saving their lives, right? Because the kale plant would keep going long after everything else had given up. And it's the first things they could get going in the, in, in the early spring. And so it is hearty and it's wonderful for you. So give kale a chance. There's lots of different things you can do with it. Okay, garlic, I'm gonna bust through this. You can find this information in my book or in my blog post online. Uh, but just to keep us on, on track time-wise, I wanted you to know you, that garlic is really easy to grow. People are really intimidated by it. They just are, they're just like, oh, garlic, I don't know. Has anyone been growing their gar own garlic? Do you grow it year after year after year? Are you keeping the cloves and growing the same garlic? But you can, right? So yes, lots of heads nodding. So, you know, I haven't bought garlic in eons because you just keep the best cloves. That's how I get a gigantic head of garlic like that in my little hand over there is because I'm continuing to keep the best heads of garlic. That became, is broken into the cloves that becomes the next year's planting. So if you're not growing garlic, please give it a chance. Also, you're gonna, har you're gonna plant it in October, you're gonna harvest it in June. You still have time to plant some of your other, your cold season crops that are gonna come along behind it you frankly could still get some warm seasons that have a lower harvest period, but play around with it. There's still time to do stuff with that space. I usually turn around and put some cold season stuff in because by the time I get my act together, it might be August now. So just play with it, um, but gardening is super easy to grow. You might want to take a picture of this slide. Again, it's on my blog, uh, but if you're new to garlic or growing garlic, there's how to grow it. It's super duper easy, okay? All right, um, caring for your crop. I wanted to touch on critters. How much time do I have, Linda? Oh, five over, little? Okay, five, 10. <laughs> no more than that, I promise. Okay, so here are the critters that I want you to know about. Okay, so our friendly rabbit, isn't he cute? You ever look out your window and watch a rabbit eating your whole bed of <laughs> whatever, lettuce? <laughs> 
I'll sit there and watch the cutest little bunny eating like leaf and just the whole leaf is like disappearing into his mouth. Isn't he cute? Okay, so must have a bunny fence. Uh, install before you plant. I see so many new gardeners and they're on Facebook and they're like, look at my vegetable garden. And they're like, yay, and it's so beautiful and it's all planted up. And then I see, they have a wide shot of it and I see no bunny fence. And I really try hard not to be that person. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't call them out on public. If I know them, I might private message them and just, hey, love your garden. You really might want to get a bunny fence like right now. Um, so because the, the bunnies will find it like practically overnight, right? And then a friend of mine did um, the upper, the higher level raised beds, really cool. She can like garden while standing up, you know? And well, she stacked all her building supplies next to the raised bed. You guys know where this is going. She created a bunny staircase, right? Bunnies went right up that and just devoured her garden. So think about these kind of things. They're very resourceful. Um, stake it in with earth staples. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yep, lots of heads nodding. Um, they just look like a big, you know, teepee thing, and you just push them down in the soil. Earth staples, I have to say, Gardener Supply Company has like the world's greatest earth staples. They're not cheap, but they will last forever. Um, I don't get paid by them, but I think they're wonderful. So check those out. Protect everything all the time, right? Okay, enemy number two, what's that guy? Japanese beetles. Okay, I want you guys to hear something that is a big passion of mine, and I want you to embrace saying no to insecticides. Okay, has anyone said no to insecticides? They're like, I say no to all insecticides. I'm really happy to see that. I get it, you know, but please don't be dusting it with seven like my grandfather did, where it's all white and covered with poison. You know, think about a different way. So Japanese beetles are tough right, because they're destroying your roses, your raspberries, your everything. They can just get in there and really do a lot of damage. Um, <clears throat> what I've found is this won't help you with like your linden tree. <laughs> you know, it's real tall and real big. I, in that case, don't plant a linden tree because Japanese beetles love them. I see some heads nodding there. But for like, for me, they love my raspberry bushes, my rose bushes. I like to say you get yourself a bucket of soapy water you know, a little hot water, a little soapy, doesn't need to be super deep. And you're going to come along at dusk, right? They go to sleep on your plants, then they're resting up for tomorrow and they're going to devour the rest of that plant. So you come along with your little, I like to use the ice cream buckets to have the handle, but whatever bucket, and you just brush them into, off the plant, straight into that water. They'll fall right down because they're sleeping. And you put a little soap, but, but soapy water, right? A couple of drops of dish soap. It makes them break the surface. They're going to go straight to the bottom you can get rid of tons of Japanese beetles that way. So think about that as an option. And then enemy number three, oh, Bambi. So pretty, so nice, right? Okay, so with regard to deer, I have to say that a seven foot tall fence is your best bet for a deer protection, it really is. I mean, but it's really not practical, right? We can't all afford to have a seven foot tall fence and we may have a giant garden and what do we do? This is, might be a case where you're sharing a little, right? <laughs> so to a degree, yep. Um, but the other thing, if you have a particular area you really want to protect, um, the product called Plant Skid, S-K-Y-D-D, -D, totally natural. Some heads are nodding. Don't Liquid fence, I've never had any luck with that. But Plant Skid, it's a blood meal product. It stinks to high heaven. Oh, but as soon as it's dry, the smell's gone, right? So I like to do it at night when I'm not going to like stink out the neighbors or my family or whatever. Um, it's really effective at d deterring pretty much everything, especially deer. And it lasts through a couple of rains, which is like not anything I've heard from any of the others. So give plants get a try. It works. Okay, a couple of things on garden friends. You guys know this, right? Toads are your friends. The less insecticides you use, the more variety you have in your garden, the more toads you will have, right? So um, look at that fat guy in my garden, right? Um, just chilling there, checking things out. Um, so really be thoughtful of your uh, not using insecticides and you'll attract all of these. Eastern tiger swallowtail butterfly in my garden on butterfly weed, and then bumblebees. I just love um, having living best life there. So uh, again, all good things for your garden. Okay, um, we've talked about vertical gardening, so I'm going to skip through that, but just a few pictures showing you what can be done. Um, and here's harvest, right? Lots and lots of harvest. All of this harvested out of my late summer garden. And um, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip to a couple of recipes. You can find these online. I have a whole blog post about how to use your harvest, and you can check out those recipes or certainly take pictures 
Anybody making marinara sauce from their garden harvest? Yeah, yeah. So um, in this pot here, we got tomatoes. I'm, I'm, usually I'm like playing with you guys, but for the sake of time, I'm gonna give you the answers. I hope that's okay, just to keep us moving. But so we got tomatoes, we got garlic, we got oregano and basil. That is it, all from my garden. Um, you could do all kinds of things with it, but that's all I'm doing here. I stuffed the crock pot full, even including cherry tomatoes. If you're inundated with cherry tomatoes, you can do an entire crock pot full of cherry tomatoes using this recipe. Um, and again, the recipe is that, it's just adding those, those options. And boom, you get that. Cook it all day, you get that. Is that true? Does it look like that when you cook it all day? What did I do in between? Yeah, with an immersion blender. You can put it into a blender, but that's way hard work. Um, do yourself a favor, if you don't have a stick blender, an immersion blender, if you're into making soups or anything that you need to, you know, squish it up like in a blender, get yourself an immersion blender. You stick that stick in there and, and you have your tomato sauce, okay? And I will say before we move on that it could be, I will say it's, I would find it a little bit thinner than I like, so I just add a little tomato paste to thicken it up. You can certainly also reduce it down by just cooking it for a very long time. Um, I do this and I put it in whatever containers I have on hand, leave a headspace, and I freeze it, okay? All this is available on my blog and in my book. Okay, homemade veggie broth. Um, so anybody making their own veggie broth? I'm telling you, what? Have you seen the price of chicken broth? It is nuts. So I will say I use vegetable broth in place of chicken broth in everything. It's more nutritious. It's um, completely free to me. <laughs> so I'm filling up a, a gallon-sized freezer bag. I just, I just mark it, date it, just put it in my freezer, start it, right? And when it's full, which might be two months later, it's time to make broth. And then I just dump it into a soup pot with it. There's an insert in here. And you bring it to a boil. And then you let it simmer. I'll let it simmer for sometimes all day long. A couple hours, all day, 30 minutes, whatever you want. The longer you simmer, the better the flavor. And this is every veggie except starchy veggies, right? No potatoes, um, but no corn, no potatoes. Pretty much everything else, I throw it in there. As long as it's not rotten, it's the stuff we wouldn't eat. The end of your celery, the, potato, or the onion skins, the top of the onions, the top of the peppers, whatever you want. Strain out the veggies and you will have the most beautiful broth you can imagine, check that out. Week and I've been eating soups that have broth in it. So, and then I freeze it. So um, yeah, it's so great, so cheap, you gotta do it. Great way to use your harvest uh, beyond fresh eating. Okay, future learning and ideas. We're gonna bust right through this. There's that compost bin that's in my garden. So, you know, I couldn't just do a plain old compost bin. I had to put a pergola on it, right? Because why not? It's cute. Then you can see my shed off in the corner there in between the fire pit that um, I designed because I thought all the fire pits out there were ugly. So I got some of my, my uh, farmer uncle's ro big rocks and made my own. Um, at any rate, there's all kinds of ideas you can do, but home composting is a great one. This is an herb spiral, and I have a blog post coming for that, too. Um, so uh, you can read all about it completely in the book, however. Um, so this is just a great way to grow herbs in a small space, and it looks real cute, I think. Um, so the other new thing I'm doing is an herb tower with like galvanized tubs, like antique galvanized tubs, or you could use new, just ca um, gradually smaller going up, and you plant your herbs around the outside, and they're stacked up on each other. That's a great one too. So different ways to grow herbs in smaller spaces. Starting seeds, there's a whole post on my, I know I keep saying this, but I can't possibly cover it all in one talk. So there's starting seeds, you can read up on it on my website, uh, and we get into it a little bit in the book. And then I wanna talk about hardscapes, and I just wanted to show you this in my garden. There's those rocks I talked about, right? So you don't have to buy things all the time. That's uh, if you've got a really nice uncle with a lot of, Field, field rocks, because he's a farmer, you might do something like this, or just find your resources. There's the fire pit I talked about, because I didn't like the ones that were out there, so I made my own. So be creative, think creatively, there's a lot you can do. Um, and so that's the um, So again, there's much more you can do and study and read about the basics of vegetable gardening. A lot to get into a one hour talk, hopefully it gave you some fundamentals and some unique ideas you can use Think about your questions for after the break, right? And in the meantime, if you haven't signed up for my emails, you'll get lots of great tips and tricks. QR codes there 
If you are not a QR code kind of person, there's a sign-up sheet back there. You can just jot your stuff down and we'll enter it for you. And then um, we're selling signed copies of my book at the back as well, where you'll go much more in depth than I can possibly cover in this talk. I'm going to turn it back over to Linda. Thank you, guys. Well, and you respond so well to thanking Lisa. So we'll, we'll just take a short break, write your questions down, and after that, we'll um, do our little thing with our drawing. Thank you. Welcome back. We're, for our online viewers, we're here today at the Iowa City Public Library, and uh, our online viewers are watching their YouTube channel of Project Green's Second Sunday Garden Forum. We're here today with Lisa Hinsman Howard, the Midwest Gardening Gal, who presented GIY, Grow It Yourself, Veggies 101. And now we have some questions for Lisa. I like to call this Stump the Garden Gal, right? Yeah. <laughs> Do you grow seeds from packets, or do you harvest and grow seeds from the plants you grow? Ooh, I have to say that I would love to aspire to do more, more of growing seeds that I harvested, but I'm primarily growing from packets right now. One thing that I do save and is very easy to grow, not a vegetable, but zinnia. So if you love your zinnias like I do, they're extremely easy to harvest the dried seed heads in the fall. I just put them right into paper sack, label them, and I replant them in the next year. For those, you really don't want to replant those until like Mother's Day, and they grow beautifully for free. So, but yes, as far as vegetables go, primarily I am growing from packets rather than harvesting my own, with the exception of garlic, which we talked about, the unique uh, issues with garlic, not issues, but the unique characteristics of garlic, and then I am saving and replanting every year. You can have one garlic, uh, a couple of cloves of garlic, and you're growing them forever by picking the best ones for saving them back to replant. You'll never have to buy garlic again. Garlic's pretty expensive in the store. What isn't it, right? How do you protect your garden from the winter cold and winter snow? Mm -hmm. I would say that primarily uh, I don't, <laughs> right? <laughs> so um, I'm working, as I mentioned, on my new class, Vegetable Gardening for All Seasons. And I'm going to tell, teach you how you can extend your season. You can certainly do some things with uh, PVC pipe that you uh, put some brackets on your raised beds, but PVC pipe and an arch over it. I see some heads nodding. You put your plastic on it and use your clamps, and you can buy yourself a little bit of time. Uh, but honestly, in our climate, and take for today, for example, uh, Frankly, once you drop down into the low 20s, even with that plastic protection, your gardening season is primarily coming to an end with the exception of some things like kale that will really, for me, keep going strong, slows down in gardening or in growing, but will keep going, growing strong for you as long as, for me anyway, it doesn't get covered in snow, which seems to make my kale really unhappy. Do you ever use a cover crop over the winter like cereal rye? I have not used cover crops yet. Has anybody here used cover crops a little bit? Yeah. So yes, I have not used cover crops myself. So that's an area I'd love to learn more about. What type of fertilizer do you recommend during the growing season for tomatoes? Is fish emulsion a good source? Yeah, fish emulsion is a great example. Um, and uh, for tomatoes, I'm certainly top dressing with compost in my beds. I'm working in that compost peat vermiculite. The peat and vermiculite does nothing from a fertilizing perspective. Its job is to lighten your soil. The compost has the nutrients, but then I am also adding, what is the name of it? Is it Jax, the tomato fertilizer? I believe it's yeah. called Jax is one I really like. It comes in a container, um, just J-A-C-K apostrophe S, Jax, and he has all kinds of different fertilizers, and there's a scoop in it, and you mix it up just like you would like the miracle Grow, that is the powder stuff, and you mix that up. It's special for tomatoes. He's got a lot of different varieties, and then you just water that right onto your tomato plants several times. I'm heavily fertilizing my tomatoes. I also use that, or that variety on my peppers, and... Um, they do awesome. And do you recommend soil tests for your beds? Yeah, I think soil tests are a really good idea to know what you've got going on in your best uh, beds. And I think every state extension office, I know for sure, 
Iowa State Extension Office and all the county offices have soil tests that you can um, stop by there and get a soil test. It just allows you to really know what's going on in your garden. And really it can help you avoid adding unnecessary nutrients if you find out that you're really lacking this, you might need some of that. It just lets you specialize what you're applying to your soil. But by and large, I really try to stick with the compost as much as possible. I'm not typically adding additional fertilizers to most of my vegetables or any other plants that I'm growing. And from the chat, any professional potting mix that you recommend? Uh, yeah, I, I do use a good quality potting mix when we're talking pots specifically. I'm not using this blend. It's too heavy for a pot. In a raised bed, it's more spread out. You can do that. You're growing primarily vegetables in those raised beds. But if you're going to a pot, I just use a good quality potting mix. I don't think you need to have the super brand names. But I will tell you, the really cheap stuff is really cheap. I think you guys have probably all found that. I don't, I don't mind when it has fertilizer in it. Um, I haven't had any downsides of having like a blend that has fertilizer in it. I've also used good quality potting soil that doesn't. But in the case of that, in the pot, you know, you're watering those pots, water's flushing through, it's running nutrients out of your soil consistently. You're going to have to supplement with another fertilizer. So frankly, I'm not here to advertise, but miracle Grow does put out a really good potting soil, but you can also use, I think, Scholl's is at Menard's. I mean, any of the, any of the name brand potting mixes, the ones that are really cheap are really cheap for a reason, and they're awful. Like, has anyone even bought the really dirt cheap potting soil? It's just awful. I mean, I don't even know. I don't think it's soil. You know, and I mean, these are potting soils. Usually a lot of times soilless mixes. It doesn't really matter. But um, just know that you're going to need to fertilize. So you might as well get one that has a good quality fertilizer built in because um, you, you will feed heavily. And if you're growing, this is off the veggie topic, if you're growing flowers in pots, you need to go beyond that soil that has uh, nutrients in it. Uh, so people think like, yay, the back says it's going to feed for nine months, I'm done. Not true. And I see lots of heads agreeing with me on this. You have to supplement your fertilizing. And in the case of flowers, I'm using a uh, liquid miracle Grow, the clear one. So I kind of gave up on the blue dust stuff because it was just such a mess. But there's bottles of the clear miracle Grow. There's one for tomatoes and peppers that I've been partial to Jack's, but I've tried that one. Works great. There's also... Um, ones uh, that are specific to just general all-purpose and then some that are called a bloom booster for your your pots that have are bloomers and um, on my blog you'll see my some of my favorite gardening products that I use and they're listed there but if you haven't used the clear one that screws onto the attachment to your hose it's life-changing from a fertilizing perspective you just walk around I'll have the all-purpose one or the one for, you know, tomatoes, peppers in that example, you just switch them out really easily. You don't have to go shut the hose off. You just pop one out, pop one in, and you just water. And then you can switch to just watering. So um, the miracle Grow uh, liquid feed is wonderful. And there, you can find links on my, on, my blog, on my blog about it. Okay. And the last question I have are suggestions. What suggestions do you have for grow bags to keep them from drying out? Uh, that is a great suggestion. Water. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes, that is a really excellent question because grow bags do indeed dry out faster than everything else, but it's also the reason carrots love them, your potatoes love them, because they're not standing in water like that, but you do have to supplement water more with the grow bags. There really isn't a solution, except I will say you can put some uh, mulch on top of the soil. That will certainly help, and by that I mean you could use wood chips, you could use, you want it something that the water can easily get through. Sometimes I've seen people use shredded newspaper, uh, but you can top off the top of your grow bag will help a lot with that water disappearing so, so fast. Just make sure you still get that water penetrating through. Okay, that's it. Any Let's... other questions from the group that you've thought of just since we've been chatting? Questions from the audience in-house? The only thing I'm thinking about is I've had experience um, not really reading very carefully the label on tomatoes that are indeterminate and determinate. Right. And what will happen? 
<laughs> repeat, repeat her question. Yes, so the question is uh, about indeterminate and determinate tomatoes and, and the difference of that is what you're talking about. And so, um, so yeah, I would say um, your indeterminate tomatoes are really what I'm growing. And so my tomatoes are producing all throughout the season. And so um, your tag will tell you that. And so you get determined that you're a little more restricted from that regard. So, but you may have a specialty tomato that you really want to grow. So you have to make that choice at that time. One thing I'll tell you about tomatoes, since we're on the topic, is make sure that you're actively pruning your tomatoes. Are you guys doing that? They will put out a tremendous amount of foliage. And I really like, first of all, you're, you're caging, right? You're giving them support. Your tomatoes definitely need support like that. They need a good, sturdy cage. And know that your tomatoes here in Iowa are going to get much taller than you ever expected they're going to get. So the little wimpy tomato cages just are not going to cut it. So I have big turbo tomato. I have some custom-made tomato cages that were just made out of wire, just big, sturdy wire. Lots of plans online or just make it up yourself. Um, but go taller than you think because they will get taller. But you want to prune your tomatoes. There's a lot of good resources online. My 12 Best Tips for Tomatoes blog post will talk about that. But you want to prune especially the lower leaves off your tomatoes. And then there's suckers that come out on your tomato plants. And the best thing to do is look online about tomato sucker to see that picture. And you can see it, uh, more information on my blog post. But you need to get those out of there because it's just excess foliage that isn't doing anything for you. By taking all the lower leaves off, um, some people are like, oh, my tomato plants are looking weird. You're opening it up so that the, fruit, the uh, fruits can get the sun. And the biggest thing is blight that tomatoes can be highly prone to. And you're really getting rid of a lot of the blight risk because blight happens when um, rain or watering splashes on your soil and splashes up on your leaves. That's how blight occurs. Also, overhead watering uh, for a lot of plants, especially tomatoes, is a bad idea. And so, I mean, sprinklers doing this on your stuff seems like a really efficient way to water. It's really bad for your, especially tomatoes, makes them really prone for getting some blight going. Um, so by trimming off those lower leaves, the stuff that's splashing up from the soil can be relieved with that. So prune your tomatoes. Lots of information online about it. Uh, your tomatoes will be much happier that way. Yeah? I have a question. What, when do you plant your garlic in the fall? Okay, the question is when do I plant my garlic in the fall? Well, the, so that would be the what would the book say <laughs> and what would reality have you do? Um, so I will say that ideally you're planting your garlic. Now I will tell you, I, I have t historically been um, delayed on getting my garlic in. I have a little busy life. And as long as you can get through the soil, I've truly planted garlic way late. Same for you know flowering bulbs, any of that. If you can get through the soil, go ahead and plant it. What's it going to hurt to give it a try, right? Follow the directions um, that's on my post or in my book, um, but you can plant late. But ideally, in the ideal world, I will say that I don't want to touch my garlic until pretty late into October now. And I, um, that's honestly, over the years, has gotten more true because of global warming. Uh, we are staying warmer longer. And you don't want, ideally, it's okay if your garlic starts sprouting up. You know, you've got it all covered up with straw if you follow the directions. It's okay if you see little sprouts come out, leave it alone. It's all right. Like almost anything that you're growing, leave it alone. Nature can handle it. Um, but if you delay your planting, often into November now for me, for my garlic, um, it really loves it, honestly, because you want to get, you, want, you don't want it to be sprouting. You want it to be putting energy into roots down low, and you don't want that all producing foliage above. And if it's warm, it will do that. The question I had was because you said you harvest yours in June, and I've typically waited till July to be out to harvest ours. Do you get garlic snakes? I do, yeah. If you're not aware of what garlic scapes are, they are the curly cue that comes out on the garlic, and it comes much earlier, and it will, it will produce a flower head if you leave it. It's producing actually a bulb up there, um, and you can cut that off. I compost the head of it. But the scapes are fabulous. It's like a gar garlicky green onion, so it's considered a delicacy. So yeah, I'll still get the scapes. And then when I say I'm harvesting in June, June, July, it all depends. But the plant tells me when to harvest it, as you know, since you're growing garlic. When it dies back by half, that's about when I, when I start pulling. And I'll kind of dig around with my finger and feel the head. You know, you can feel the head in there and know if it's getting time. 
Uh, but the, the plants usually tell me, if you wait too long, you're going to have a dust. <laughs> you know, if you forget, and pretty soon your plant has died all the way down, that bulb is more than likely just going to be dust in there. And can you plant them too deep? Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yeah, so follow the, the directions on the, the planting depth. And yeah, like anything, if you could certainly go too deep, too shallow. But, you know, by and large, I say with gardening, don't overthink it. It's all a grand experiment. And I like to say there's always next year. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Happens to me every year. There's always next year. You know, something's not going to go the way that you planned. Just say there's next year and you've learned some things along the way. And sometimes you did everything right. And I will say that's especially true for tomatoes. Some years, tomatoes are great. Like I can't, you know, I just, there are so many tomatoes and everything's fantastic. Other years I've done everything you're supposed to do and I can't grow a tomato to save my life. I'll get a few. You know, it's just very, they're very picky that way. Peppers can be the same kind of thing. They'll be like nothing for peppers. They're really late blooming peppers, although I did everything I was supposed to do. Last year, did you guys grow peppers? It was like pepper palooza for sure, for me. And I heard that from lots of others. So many peppers. Like I, you know, whatever I did, the peppers just did great. So yeah, just there's always next year. Don't, don't be too hard on yourself, right? All right, other questions? Yeah? There was something in the photo of your garden that gigantically tall. Yes. Was that the um, what were you talking about? Were, was it the, a gigantically tall tower thing? Yeah. That is actually a bean tower. And I got it from, I'm sorry, I keep pitching it because I don't make a nickel from them. Garden, I should. Gardner's Supply Company has a great, they have great, really strong galvanized. Um, and it folds flat. Uh, I keep mine out in the garden. I might move it around or whatever, but you can fold, it folds flat. You can put it away, but it's galvanized and so strong you don't have to. But I, I, I always plant pole beans. Some people love bush beans. If you have a particularly bush bean variety, grow it. For me, my gardens, I'm trying to grow as much as I can. So I'm, it, it will say pole beans, P-O-L-E, on the packet. They're going to grow up something. They need a support. It's also a perfect thing to do for that cattle panel trellis. Like doing arch is really cool. Connecting your two raised beds, for example. You can walk underneath it, you know, and, and that's beautiful. And when you plant pole beans, they're going to put out colorful uh, flowers and beautiful pods and easier to pick than bush beans. That, in that example, what you saw was a bean tower. Could use it for peas, but they wouldn't get as tall. But when it was fully planted, which I do not believe it was in that picture, it would have beans just spilling over it. You would not know what was under it for the structure, but it was full of beans. Yeah, great question. Yeah. Was your teepee, was that the top panel, the tower, or the yeah. triangle? Yep. Yeah, you can, yep. And make a teepee. Yes, exactly right. You'd fold it in the case, and then in the case of, I, I didn't have a picture in this, in this presentation, but the cattle panel that I do the arch with, I just do it as an arch. But you can also make it a teepee if you want. Yep. And I'm not cutting it. The, now, you have to understand, cattle panel's sturdy. Like, you are going to need to really work with it. You know, have some really strong folks helping you. Uh, you know, it's not, not a one-person project. This gal's nodding her head. I mean, it's when you bring that cattle panel home and you think you're going to bend it into an arch, and you're like, are you kidding me right now? But once you get those T-posts, really strong T-posts in place, for in the case of the arch or the teepee, frankly, um, you're going to arch it over. If, if it's a teepee, you're going to have to do that before you're installing it, so you're going to get it fully folded. Um, it's not easy. I would tell you the arch is easier, but it's still hard. And you think that thing's got so much torque on it, you know, you're like, you're going to injure somebody when that thing breaks loose. But <laughs> yeah, but once you get it, have, have a bunch of, you know, strong, tough people to get that secured. Once you get it there and you get it all securely fastened, it's never going to move again. It looks really cool. It will never rust, in my experience. And you're going to grow things on it year after year after year. You can do really cool climbing squash. Oh, butternut squash. Don't get me started. We'll be here all day. <laughs> Butternut squash. Um, they are one of the bigger squashes that can fully stay on the vine hanging. So they are a great one to do up and over a cattle panel trellis. They'll just hang there beautifully. They're so cool and they're so easy to grow and cure. And I just made squash soup, you know, butternut squash soup this weekend when it's all cold and horrible. Um, cures beautifully. It's been storing in my basement, just sitting on the floor with a up on a little thing to keep it off the ground, but just sitting there. <laughs> There's a process. You got to cure it 
There's a whole more information about that as well. So lots always learning, right? The only other thing I want to ask is like, I, I might be what the question might have been about. It was a white tier type. Plan. Yes, what, what, what the towers. That? Yes. That? Yep. So that's just a tower that I bought. Um, and they stack together and they go side side. And if you search like, you know, gardening tower, um, they, they go back and forth. They fully collapse into each other to store. Mine have just been hanging out in my garden for a long time. And I rigged it up to stand taller. So I try to like reinvent new ways to do things. That's part of the fun. So inside there, there's rebar running through the middle of it because it has a hole. They all have a hole down the center. And there's rebar. And then I put PVC pipe underneath the tower so it has something to sit on. It's all set in concrete. Um, I will tell you though, I was just telling my mom, I think I'm taking my towers out next year. Um, they look cute and all, but their practicality, they dry out terribly. Um, they're just not, the, the spaces are not big enough. And I've tried a number of things. At first I was like, I'm gonna grow herbs in here. Just too dry, and even though herbs like to be dry, too dry. And it was like continuous watering. And my latest thing that worked best was like marigolds, which is great to have all in, in your vegetable garden to put out all that lovely fragrance. But even they just get so dry, and then you gotta, to get them really looking nice, you're deadheading constantly. It just wasn't very practical. So I'm, now that I've put in that new raised bed, as I told you about, to be the longer, skinnier version, I'm gonna have all that nice open space, and I'm gonna take those towers out and embrace it. So I will tell you, just keep changing it. If you don't like it, do something different, you'll learn something new. Yes, gardeners can always correct their mistakes. That's right. <laughs> and you don't know until you try, you know? Jump in, play with it. I've honestly put up with the towers. Everybody loves the look of them. I always get a question about what they are. Um, and they do look cute out there, but they're not practical in practice. Yeah. It looked also like you had something made out of PVC pipe. Yes, true. Well, yeah. Was that just another tower? Um, so the PVC pipe that you saw was um, on the side of the raised beds. You can get some basic brackets from the hardware store and screw those in to the size of the PVC that you're using. And it's, you want to get skinny enough to be able to bend it, right? And you can tell when you're in, in Menards, for example, you can do this and does it bend over? Will it make an arch? And then I'm inserting it up and over and inserting it on the other bracket. And what I'm doing with that is I'm using it to extend my season with plastic um, coverings. So generally, uh, it could be early in the spring. A lot of times I'm doing it in the fall to get a little week or two longer in my gardening season. You're not going to get a lot. I just always try to tell people without having a full greenhouse, you got to be practical about what you can really do because when the temperatures fall low 20s, that is, you know, when you get to like 28 degrees, that is a hard killing frost and few things can survive it. And I have, I'm really, uh, I find it really interesting to monitor the temperature inside those plastic houses when I've tried this and you get a few degrees, but not that much more. There was one that looked like it was a crate. Cage. <laughs> Use elbows with PVC to make hmm. a cage. I don't recall that. Like white PVC? Yeah, the PVC, yeah. Hmm. It was one of your first slides. Elbows. Let's go see. Because <laughs> like now I'm like, I want to know. Whoop, did you find it? No, no, keep, no. Keep, keep we're way, back. yeah. Way what was back. your very first one? Okay. We're going to go there. Whoops. Whoop. One more. Not that one. Right there. Right, right there in the center. center. Oh, yeah. Da, 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 da. oh, I got you. Thank you for pointing that out. That is a, um, it's fully made with PVC and elbows and things. That is a support for raspberry bushes. Yeah. So I actually learned that at a um, Lane County Master Gardener's Garden Walk. Do you remember? <laughs> and um, yeah, and it'll last forever. Uh, but it is holding back, it's a row of raspberries in there. Yep. So as, because I always change things, they're not there anymore. I've moved the raspberries. But that PVC would have lasted forever if I wanted to continue to do that. So, and somebody actually took it and you know, they were doing raspberries or whatever so they were gonna give it a try. But way better than, to me, way cooler looking than you know, the T posts with the wires that are um, historically done with raspberries. There's no wire going down the center. They're just caged in with that PVC. Super easy to make, just 
purely pe there's no rebar, there's nothing. Um, no, I take that back. There are rebar holding them on the corners, holding it to the ground. Uh, but those going across are purely PVC and elbows that connect it all, like putting together a little puzzle. <laughs> if I can do it, you guys can do it. Yeah. Okay, one last question. <laughs> So you moved your raspberries because they were getting out of control, or why, why did you take them out? Because we've been thinking about mm -hmm. raspberries, too, and I'm like, I'm kind of wondering. Well, <laughs> yeah. first of all, I will tell you, a, a raspberry you should grow if you're not is false gold. It's a golden raspberry. You can't buy it in any store. Are you growing false gold? Yeah. Aren't they just the most delicious, fabulous raspberries? You'll get a summer <laughs> crop. You'll get a fallish crop, in my experience. But you know what they do? Can I ask you, do your false... Do your, do your raspberries, are they, what's your border around your raspberries? Is it like the lawn or? It's the yeah. lawn, Brock, and then the tea post with the wire. Okay. Because, you know, raspberries, what they, what they like to do is they scamper underground, right? So they're sending out runners. And so my raspberries, I didn't move them. They moved themselves. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and so they started coming up in actually one of the raised beds that you see the teepee thing. They started coming up over there, and I was like, well, I didn't really like you there anyway. I still had plenty of sun. So I just kind of let them stay there, and I took out the other ones. And, you know, raspberry canes die back. And, and you know, I had a few that still looked decent that, you know, I moved or gave away. Um, but, yeah, it's just all experiment. But raspberries, I will tell you, will move. If I had to do it over again, I would probably put my raspberries so that I literally could mow around the bed. You know what I mean? Because you'll never... You'll never stop having raspberries come up in places you don't want them. Not in a horrible, naughty way. I dig them up and give them away all the time. But, and they're beautiful plants that come up. But I, because I'm in mulch, just on soil, they come up everywhere. I mean, not, they're, they're right near there. They're, they're sending out runners, so it's not everywhere. But, yeah, they move. And so they move themselves. <laughs> so then what I did was I actually have, that's a whole nother class, but I have, uh, I actually have a tomato pot garden back there, and so I got these great big, you have to read about it in the book, <laughs> or on my website, 12, uh, my 12 best tips for tomatoes talks all about that. Not about the raspberries, but it'll tell you what I did with that space instead. Yeah. Always, always learning. Let's thank Lisa again. Thanks, guys. <laughs>